So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chetan Dandekar. I'm a senior product manager in the deployment and management services among, within AWS. I focus mainly on cloud formation. And today, uh, this session is about diving deep into infrastructure as code on AWS. And cloud formation is one of our flagship services for doing infrastructure as code on AWS. Um, and I know we have a diverse audience here. There are some people who have never used AWS. There are some who, have, who are experts at AWS. There are some who are already doing infrastructure as code. There are some who are in a more traditional operations. Um, but I promise there is something for everyone, even though some of this stuff might be already known to some of you. Uh, so bear with me, and I promise there is, there is useful stuff here for everyone in the audience. Um, so you are attending infrastructure as code session, so I assume you are already on board uh, this train, which is uh, likely you are in a business where you need to innovate fast, experiment fast, so that you can distinguish yourself from the other guy. Um, innovating fast also means that you should be able to fail fast and reduce the risk uh, in failure so that you don't lose the next opportunity. And obviously, continuous delivery, continuous integration um, enable that innovative, uh, agile business uh, because you can push features out fast. Uh, if something works, you can double down quickly on that. If something doesn't work, you can course correct really quickly. Uh, and that's continuous delivery. And obviously, the whole DevOps movement supports continuous delivery because there is good communication, sharing, automation, which allows you to be that agile, uh, to be able to double down on things that are working and you know, to eliminate things that are not working. And infrastructure as code in particular and cloud in general supports DevOps because you can automate everything. You can treat everything as software even if there are servers which are serving web requests or databases or networking components. You can write software for managing all of it um, and automate it and hence deliver that continuously. So how do you do infrastructure as code on AWS? The flagship service for that is AWS CloudFormation. And for those who are not familiar with CloudFormation, um, it allows you to create templates of the architectures and applications that you want to run on AWS. And it, the architectures could mean anything. In the traditional sense, it would mean network storage and compute. Uh, but in, in the new era of cloud computing, it could mean DynamoDB tables or uh, Elastic Cache clusters, S3 buckets, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it allows you to create templates of the architectures you want to have. You pass those templates to the service, and then the service figures out what are the steps it needs to take to get you to that architecture. So you, pro you specify the desired state, and CloudFormation figures out how to get there, and you don't have to worry about the granular, AP granular API calls that you need to make to individual service. So let's say you are provisioning a web application. Um, you, you probably have S3 bucket, an RDS database, um, a web server, a CloudFront distribution, and so on and so forth. And with CloudFormation, you don't have to figure out individual API calls for each of these services. You don't have to figure out the order of creation for each of these resources. Um, and you don't have to worry about failure modes, if any. So uh, um, if, if a request times out, you don't need to worry about retrying it. CloudFormation does it automatically for you. Uh, so that's fundamentally different from the traditional approach of pr provisioning scripts, where you have to figure out every step and debug every step which might go wrong. This is more like building a CAD model and handing it over to a 3D printer, and the printer prints out the desired object for you. When you have templates, you can follow the time-tested software engineering principles on the, temp on the templates. So you can version control them, code review them, create replicas, branch them, use them in multiple AWS accounts or regions, and they, they will work as expected. We also have customers who integrate CloudFormation templates into their CI CD pipelines like Jenkins um, or Atlassian Bamboo. The basic workflow that you have while using CloudFormation is something like this. You, first of all, you have a business problem, and you design a solution for that problem. And broadly, you, you will need to write application code. 
to implement the business logic, and then you will need to have infrastructure to host that application. So you de design application code, implement application code, and also design the infrastructure templates. From the templates, you create stacks, which are a collection of resources. Uh, CloudFormation creates those stacks for you from the templates. And then CloudFormation also has hooks to let you deploy the application packages on top of those stacks of infrastructure resources. Um, and once you have a stack, it's basically infrastructure and application running and serving your customers. And obviously, you're not going to stop there. You're going to continue to iterate on it. So we'll, we will follow through this workflow that you can enable using CloudFormation. Uh, just to take an example, imagine you are in the food ordering business or food delivery business. Um, you will probably have a bunch of services like these, a, a food catalog, a billing service, a payment service, a customer database, and so on and so forth. Uh, whether you call it service-oriented architecture or microservices, it's up to you. But it's, either way, you're going to have a lot of services. Um, and they are going to have interactions between them and dependencies among them. So um, a food ordering, uh, the food catalog might want some information from the recommendation service or the customer database and so on and so forth. Um, so when you are modeling this in cloud formation, each service or each um, independent unit of operation could be modeled as a stack, depending on the complexity. If it's too complex, you can also divide it into multiple stacks. Uh, but we are going to deep, uh, dive deep into the food catalog website. So let's say you want to design a web application, which is a catalog uh, of food items. In cloud formation, or actually in AWS, it will look something like this. Uh, you obviously need a security group to secure the application. You need a server to, uh, to serve the requests. And you're also going to be scaling up or down, uh, which is done using an auto-scaling group. Uh, you need a load balancer. Um, and obviously, you need the brain of that application, which is the software that you're going to write. So you need a way to deploy that software. Um, and it's not an island. Uh, the food catalog service is going to take information from other services like the database service and recommendation service. So you need some way to get that information into the food catalog website. And then you might want to optimize it, optimize this application by doing things like um, adding a mem memcache cluster or adding some alarms uh, so that you can take action if something things are not going too well. And so this is your web application that you want to run on AWS. And now we're going to walk through how you model that in CloudFormation. Um, so if you look inside a CloudFormation template, you can model each of these resources. And they look something like what I, we have on the right side. Uh, each of the resources are modeled as JSON, JSON objects. And notice that they describe the desired state that you want to have. For the web server group, you specify how many, what's the range of uh, instances, what's the range of number of instances you want to have. And you can, uh, uh, the, the actual number of instances can vary in that range based on the load. Uh, and then you can specify things like an auto-scaling group is connected to a load balancer. But you don't have to write the code which actually makes API calls to the auto-scaling APIs and actually provisions the instance for you, um, and then goes and uh, provisions a load balancer for you. We have some customers who write JSON directly, and we have customers who don't like to write JSON. Uh, so what they do is they use um, tools where, uh, which are typically written in their favorite programming language like Ruby or Python that generate the JSON templates. So that's the second option that you have to create CloudFormation templates. Uh, and a third option that is emerging is also there are some tools out there which let you create CloudFormation templates graphically by dragging and dropping these objects and generating JSON out of it. So there are multiple ways to create these JSON templates, but ultimately you're going to see something, a model like this. Um, there is information that you need to supply into a CloudFormation stack. Uh, so in our example, you want to get in what's the DB endpoint for the customer database, or um, what's, the, uh, you know, what's the endpoint for the recommendation service, and so, so on and so forth. And the way you get information in into a CloudFormation stack is by passing in parameters. Um, they are not freeform. You can add validation logic around it. So for example, uh, if, you want to, if you want to choose 
from a limited set of instance types. You can actually specify that. Uh, if you want to make sure that a value that you're passing in is a valid VPC ID, you can actually specify AWS EC2 VPC ID as a parameter data type. Uh, and that allows um, you to make sure that this, the input that is getting into a stack is, uh, is valid. On the other side, you also need to get information out. So once you have this stack set up, the stack as an application is going to have an endpoint. Um, so you can specify the outputs that you want to get out of the stack. Uh, in this case, you know, it will be the DNS name or the IP address of the elastic load balancer. And the, this is an important part, which is deploying application that actually runs on the web servers. Um, the primary way to bring in software bits and bootstrapping them on a web server uh, in CloudFormation is what we call CloudFormation init. We will go uh, deep into this, uh, this topic a little later in this presentation. Um, and then for convenience, the CloudFormation template language provides multiple other functions um, like you know, a, getting an attribute of a resource or joining a string and so on and so forth. And we actually uh, just launched support for executing Lambda, invoking Lambda functions while you are creating Cloud Function stacks. So that opens a door for writing any code that you want uh, while creating a Cloud Function stack and getting it executed. So let's say you want to uh, reverse a string. Uh, you can actually write a Lambda function, get the string reversed, and use it in a CloudFormation stack. Uh, once you have a template, you, you can use the CloudFormation console to upload the template, specify the parameter values, and create a stack. Obviously, if you are practicing infra infrastructure as code, chances are you want to automate all of this, so you won't go to the console to create the stack. You will probably use the APIs, the SDKs, or the command line to provide the template and create the stack you can still come back to the console to see the health of the stack. So once your stack is created, you're going to see the status of each stack that you have and some useful information like the events uh, that happened for each stack, uh, the templates associated with it, or tags that are added to each of the stack. And as I mentioned, uh, I'm using infrastructure as a very broad term. It's not just network, compute, and storage. Uh, CloudFormation today supports over 20 AWS services, and we are continuously uh, adding support for more and more AWS features. Uh, so you can provision any of this through CloudFormation. And that was the basic workflow. Now, if we double-click on creating infrastructure templates, um, you can treat these templates just like any other software. You can code them using your favorite development tools right from Visual Studio to Vim. Um, you can version control them, run code reviews. You can even run unit tests. So let's say you have a complex architecture. Naturally, you're going to have some logical uh, modular, uh, you know, modularization in that architecture. So you might have a subnet uh, independent of some other subnet. And when you're editing a template for a given subnet, before merging it back to your main branch, you can actually run unit tests on any changes that you have made to that subnet template. So you can apply any, any software engineering principles that you apply to your application code. Uh, and in fact, I have heard this thing, uh, this, uh, this phrase multiple times from my customers, which is, it's all software. There is no infrastructure is software just like application code is software. And what that means is you can organize it like software. So you don't have to create one stack for all your resources, or you don't have to create individual stacks for each one of your resources that you have in your AWS accounts. Uh, you can actually organize them based on how well their lifecycle aligns and uh, the common purpose that they work towards. So for example, if you have one web application which has a common business problem that it solves, all the resources for that web application can be part of one stack. If you have a VPC and a, a bunch of subnets which are shared across a lot of different applications, you probably don't want to bundle them with the applications. You probably create, want to create a separate stack for them. Uh, so this is what we typically see uh, uh, with some of our customers, which is you will have a very basic identity layer with your IAM users and policies. Then you have a networking layer with the VPCs and subnets, which are relatively stable. 
Um, then there are some shared services, and at the very top there are web applications which come and go very frequently. Now, another thing to note is that if you are creating, say, a network component specifically for a given web application, then obviously you want to bundle it with the web application. So let's say you're creating a security group for each of your web application, then you don't want that security group to be uh, in the bottom layer, in the bottom base networking layer. You want that security group to, to be bundled with that application. And once you have organized templates uh, in, in this fashion or whichever other fashion that, su that suits your operations, then you can actually recreate these things in multiple environments like dev or staging or production, or let's say you create new AWS accounts, you can repeat these things in those accounts very quickly. Um, let's say, you, or you expand into a, another AWS region, you can use the same set of templates and same organization to quickly recreate your entire, um, you know, entire set of applications in those accounts or regions. Um, just to complete this analogy, so if you think about application software, uh, you know, somebody writes a source code, you build it and you package it, uh, and then there is typically a loader or interpreter which actually interprets that application code, and then ultimately you reach where you have a, a de that application in a desired state uh, in, a, in a server's memory. So infrastructure is no different uh, when you're using cloud formation. Uh, you have uh, JSON templates or scripts which generate JSON templates. Um, you, pa um, you, know, you package those templates and then you pass them on to CloudFormation. And CloudFormation acts as a loader and interpreter of those templates and creates the desired state of the infrastructure for you in the cloud. Um, and obviously, you're not going to, once you set up your application, you're not going to stop. stop. So we also have support for iterating on the infrastructure that you have provisioned. Um, there are two main ways to iterate. There is uh, what we call in-place updates. So you update your templates, and then with an updated template, you call update stack on the same stack that is running. Uh, or you can do blue-green deployment, where you take the updated template and create a new stack from scratch without touching your existing stack. Uh, and then once the new stack comes up and is tested, then you start moving traffic to the new stack. And there are pros and cons for each of these approaches. Uh, the in-place update is faster because typically an incremental change on an existing stack is going to be faster than recreating a whole stack. You're going to spend less money because you're not duplicating the resources you already have. Um, and most importantly, I think, uh, you don't have to worry about transferring the data and application state that you might have in a stack because you're not really creating a completely new stack. Whereas if you create a new stack, then you have to make sure that your data from the old stack is migrated over to the new stack. On the other, other hand, there is a big advantage to blue-green, which is you are never touching a running stack. So if anything goes wrong at any point, you can always fall back on the old stack. Um, and you don't have to be limited to the 20 or so services that CloudFormation supports. So we have an extensibility mechanism called custom resources in CloudFormation which is essentially a plugin system which lets you plug in your own logic as part of the stack creation. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a specific example. So let's say you have that food catalog website, which is a web application, um, which is running in AWS using lo lo lots of different types of AWS resources. And you want to use a third-party web analytics service to go with this application. So when this stack is provisioned, you also want to provision a subscription in that analytics service for this web application. You can actually model that in a CloudFormation template. Uh, you, uh, in a CloudFormation template, you will write a custom resource, um, and you will also specify a what we call service token, which is an identifier for that third-party service, uh, and then pass uh, information like you know what plan you have or what IP address uh, the service should use, and so on and so forth, uh, to that service. And cl when CloudFormation interprets this, uh, it will go on provisioning all the regular stuff as it will uh, in AWS. And when it encounters a custom resource, it will actually call the third-party service and tell it to provision a web analytics subscription, wait for success or failure, and bring it back to the stack. So if it succeeds, then that external resource essentially becomes a part of the stack. Um, and if it fails, the stack is rolled back. So it become, even though you're using AWS and non-AWS resources, 
it becomes a single unit of deployment. And this custom resource mechanism can also be used not only to, well, it, it can be used not only to uh, provision third party resources, but also uh, supplement the CloudFormation provisioning with your own custom logic. And it will be more clear uh, with this new feature uh, that we launched. So um, before, uh, before integrating Lambda, to implement a custom resource, either you or the third party would have to implement your own web service to which can receive requests from CloudFormation. Requests like create this resource, update resource, rollback resource, and so on and so forth. We launched uh, Lambda integration just yesterday, which allows you to write Lambda function and be able to call that function as a custom resource from a CloudFormation stack. So you, here is your CloudFormation stack, and uh, you can have a custom resource which represents, represents your Lambda function in the stack, and when a stack is created, updated, or deleted, we'll make a call to that la Lambda function, let it run the logic that you have written, and get back the output. And this is useful for things like uh, looking up an AMI ID. So if you're already using CloudFormation, and if you're using Windows, you might be aware that the Windows AMI IDs change every month on AWS. Uh, so one of the tasks that you need to do is update those Windows AMI IDs. And until now, you had to do that statically, or, uh, but now not anymore. Now you can write a Lambda function which automatically looks up the latest Windows AMI IDs on Amazon and use them for any Windows stack that you're creating, uh, which is also true for a custom AMI ID. So let's say you have, you're baking your own custom AMIs and tagging them with a particular version number. Now you can write a Lambda function which looks up your custom AMI IDs for a, based on a specific tag and gets the right AMI ID back uh, so it makes it simpler to automate that process rather than you looking up the right AMI ID and passing it in to a CloudFormation stack. Uh, there are a lot of uh, our customers who do cross-stack references. That is, they have separate stacks for separate purposes. They have a networking stack, a database stack, and an application stack, and they need to pass information from one stack to another. They want to refer to, say, a subnet or a security group um, that is in a different stack from an application stack. Um, until now, you had to look up the subnet ID or the security group ID and pass it in manually as an, uh, uh, to that application stack that is using the subnet. Now you can write a Lambda function, embed that in the application stack, and it will look up the right subnet ID and security group for you. Uh, and the list goes on. I mean, any, any custom logic that you want to implement, if you want to, you know, if you have a smart espresso machine and want to order a coffee when a stack is successfully created, uh, you can write a Lambda function for that. And if somebody does write that Lambda function, please let us know, and we'll be very happy to you know, write a blog post about it. Um, moving on to a, a, a related topic. Uh, we, we talked a lot about infrastructure provisioning, but the, it really goes hand in hand with application deployment. If you want to automate infrastructure provisioning, it's only useful if you can also automate application deployment. So, for a few, few more slides, I'm going to talk about infrastructure provisioning as code and application deployment as code. Um, infrastructure provisioning is obviously things like networking provisioning, provisioning queues, uh, Kinesis streams, uh, and so on and so forth. And then application deployment is once you have EC2 servers running, you want to download packages, boot, uh, you know, install them at the right place, bootstrap the application, and so on and so forth. And you can model all of this in a CloudFormation template, uh, and that we automated. And there are multiple ways of describing application deployment and making it happen in, a, in context of a CloudFormation template. And we'll dive deeper into, e into those options. So at the, at the very basic level, you obviously have the Amazon machine, machine images or armies that you can use. Uh, you can use the Amazon provided armies or third party armies or your own armies that you bake. Um, then we have this flexible mechanism called CloudFormation init, which lets you describe the application configuration you want to have, and then CloudFormation makes it happen for you. Uh, CloudFormation init also serves as an entry point for any other configuration tool that you might want to use. Uh, so let's say you want to use Chef or Puppet or our own AWS code deploy. Uh, you can use CloudFormation init to install an agent that brings in those tools. And then 
Lastly, you can also use OpsWorks. So OpsWorks is our application management service, uh, which you can use in context of CloudFormation. And OpsWorks itself bring, is, uh, provides its own chef recipes, and also it lets you bring your own chef recipes. And we'll dive deep into each of these sort of three options that you have. Um, starting with CloudFormation in it, uh, it's, it follows the same declarative model that the infrastructure part of CloudFormation follows. So you don't have to specify the stepwise instructions the, for, uh, for downloading, configuring, and bootstrapping an application. You just have to tell us that in a declarative way. So uh, things like list of packages that you want to install, or the sources that you want to download and unzip, uh, the commands that you want to run, and so on and so forth. Yeah, just to give you an example of what I mean by declarative, so let's say you're downloading an application package from S3 bucket. You don't have to actually write the commands that downloads the package from S3, or if the request times out, then retries it, and so on and so forth. We do that for you. You just have to tell us the, um, the source from which to get the package and the destination for the package on the web server that you're provisioning. And it's, it, it's the same pattern for anything else th uh, that CloudFormation in its supports. Um, it is debuggable uh, in the sense that it pro produces lots of logs, and you don't even have to log on to the machines, SSH into the machines to actually see those logs. You can see them in the console using another of AWS service called CloudWatch Logs. We'll look into slight more detail, sli slightly more detail into that later. Um, and you can also do updates. So typically, we'll have customers who, uh, who update, who have a stack running, and then may maybe they want to install an extra package or a new version of the package. So what they would do, th what they do is uh, they update a template, call update stack using the updated template, and then there is a CloudFormation daemon running on each of the web, ser web servers called CFN Hub, which detects those changes and, um, and reconciles that web server with the new update. So it will incrementally uh, bring that uh, uh, web server to the new configuration. And as I mentioned before, it, CloudFormation init serves as an entry point for any other configuration tool. Uh, so let's say you want to use Chef. What you would do is you will have CloudFormation init to install the Chef client, and then you can bring in your existing Chef recipes uh, for things like installing uh, WordPress onto the web server. AWS Code Deploy follows the same model. So you can install the AWS Code Deploy agent using CloudFormation in it, and then let AWS Code Deploy do the rest. And this model works well when you actually want to have a, a very clear distinction between infrastructure provisioning and application deployment. So maybe you want to deploy infrastructure and not change it very often, and then do dozens of application deployments on the same infrastructure then you might want to consider this option where uh, you use CloudFormation for infrastructure provisioning and then use some other service uh, with a nice console and everything to, uh, to do the application deployment. Um, needless to say, we, pro, uh, we support authentication mechanisms, so you don't have to, when you're installing your application packages onto CloudFormation stack, you don't have to open it up to public. You can keep them behind your S3 credentials, you can also use GitHub uh, and download packages from GitHub directly onto CloudFormation stacks. Um, so when you're using AWS CloudFormation in it, uh, you actually trigger that process through the user data script that you might be familiar with. So when you, when you boot up an EC2 instance, you get to run that user data script, which is the initial script on an EC2 instance. Uh, so you... Uh, you would download the AWS CloudFormation init package, trigger it, let it do its job, and then once it's done, you can signal it back uh, uh, to CloudFormation. So your user data script will look something like that. Um, you can also use CloudWatch logs for debugging. We, talk, we touched on this a few slides ago, and I wanted to uh, go into specifics. So if you want to pump out the CloudFormation init logs and send them out to CloudWatch and view them in, cloud, in AWS console, um, then you have to do some slight configuration in your template. So when you are, uh, along with your own packages and services, uh, you have to drop the uh, CloudWatch logs configuration file onto, uh, onto your instances that you're provisioning, 
and then it will start streaming your CF and init logs onto CloudWatch. And the good thing about that is you don't, you don't ever have to log on or SSH into your instances. You can see those in the console. Now, moving on to the second approach, which is baking armies and using armies to boot uh, applications in your CloudFormation stacks. Uh, clearly, there is CloudFormation init provides a lot of flexibility and uh, visibility into uh, what, what goes into your application deployment. So long after you have deployed your application and application is running, you can go back to your CloudFormation init configuration and see what you in install and have a fairly good idea about what's running in a stack. Uh, compare that with AMI. AMI is, is a black box. So once you bake an AMI, it's very hard to recall what actually is running in that AMI. But on the other hand, it also has an advantage, which is uh, whenever you bake an AMI, it's set in stone. So if you want to have that assurance that once I bake an AMI, nobody's going to touch it and I know exactly what it is, uh, then AMI uh, could be a good option. Uh, and also, AMI is the, is the fastest way to boot an instance. Uh, when you are using CFN in it, CloudFormation in it, or Chef, or any other configuration, it is actually going to do that configuration after the instance boots. So basically, it is in downloading all the packages and all the configuration scripts and then running them uh, after the instance boots. Uh, when you're using Amazon Machine Images or AMIs, it's all baked in. So the boot time is really, uh, really short. So we see this pattern among a lot of our customers where uh, during the development and testing phase, they want that flexibility for configuring applications. So they use CloudFormation in it or use it data scripts or Chef. Uh, once they have reached a, a release candidate, then they bake an army out of that. And then when they want to scale really uh, scale to a, a really large number of instances and really quickly, then they use that baked army. Uh, the important thing to note is that even if you are baking armies, uh, make sure that you keep a track of uh, the CloudFormation init script that went into that army, because otherwise, once an army is baked, you will have no way to know, you know what you have configured in that army. Uh, now, the third approach for application deployment with CloudFormation is using CloudFormation and OpsWorks together. Uh, we looked at the infrastructure provisioning and application deployment, and you know, you might ask, I can do everything through CloudFormation template or even a shell script, then why should I use OpsWorks? And uh, the answer to that is this. There are two main benefits to using OpsWorks. One, it provides a well-defined application lifecycle. Um, so we looked at CloudFormation in it a, a few slides ago, and you know, it provides you a lot of flexibility, and it lets you define your own lifecycle. So you, you can say, this is the point where the application is installed, this is the point where the application is rebooted, and so on and so forth but you have to define the application lifecycle. Uh, but if you are looking for a well-defined application lifecycle, OpsWorks provides it for you. And then, um, so Ops, Ops, OpsWorks already has entry points uh, like uh, when the application is initialized or rebooted, uh, shut down, and so on and so forth. And then you can just hook in your own Chef scripts or, or any other configuration scripts at those well-defined points. So that's one advantage. And then the second advantage is uh, it provides an interactive console to then adjust the application uh, profile. So if you want to scale up once the ap application is running uh, in an interactive way, you can go to OpsWorks console, look at the metrics, and then scale it, scale it up or scale it down. Uh, so that's the, that's the benefit that uh, OpsWorks provides. Uh, so we have customers who use, uh, some of our customers use, do everything purely through CloudFormation init and CloudFormation. And then there are some others who decide that they want to do purely infrastructure through CloudFormation. And then when it comes to managing EC2 and application on EC2, they use OpsWorks. Um, so there is, a, there is a convenience versus control trade-off that they have to make. Because uh, so you, if you're getting the well-defined lifecycle, then obviously you won't have any way to arbitrarily define the, the application lifecycle that you can in CloudFormation in it. Um, so this is the model that uh, you know what, what we are call what we call CloudFormation and OpsWorks side by side, and you can actually automate all of this. So you can also model your OpsWorks configuration inside a CloudFormation template. Um, so even if you are using, if you, even if you are in a fully automated way and you still want to use OpsWorks, you can uh, use OpsWorks 
along with other resources in a CloudFormation template. So this is OpsWorks inside CloudFormation. Um, and then moving on to other tools of the trade, uh, we also see customers integrate CloudFormation with their CI CD pipelines, uh, things like Jenkins and Bamboo. Um, and pretty soon they will also integrate with uh, our own CI CD system code pipeline and code commit. Uh, but this is the general pattern that we see. Uh, typically, they have a set of infrastructure developers who focus on the common artifacts like network or databases. And then there are a set of app developers who focus on one business problem, typically an application. Um, all of them use a common tool chain um, to store the application code and the infrastructure templates. The templates written by the DevOps team or the infrastructure team are typically broad. Uh, things like IAM policies, uh, network configuration. And then if the application developers want any application-specific infrastructure, like let's say you have an application which needs a DynamoDB table or an Elastic Cache cluster, then those templates are better off uh, being owned by the application team. So they also have their own templates. Um, and then they go through the code reviews, uh, continuous integration systems uh, unit test, um, and when they have all the artifacts, the app packages, the CloudFormation templates ready, then they call CloudFormation APIs to provision the stacks and deploy the application bits in any of their environments, in any accounts or regions. I'm seeing a few pictures being taken, so I'm just taking a pause for that. Um, and then if you are new to CloudFormation, if you're already using AWS through the console or let's say through CLI, you don't have to start with a blank slate. You can start templatizing uh, your existing resources and convert them, their configuration into infrastructure as code. And the primary tool to do that is what we call CloudFormer. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beta tool that uh, we publish and you can stand it up as a web, web application in your account, and it will walk you through your existing resources. You can select the resources that you want to templatize, and it will output a base template. Uh, you will have to do some post-processing, things like, uh, you know, it will output an EC2 instance with an actual AMI ID that it was created from, but you obviously want to parameterize that. Uh, so you have to do some post-processing on that, and then you are good to go. And then once you have that post-process template, then you can actually replicate that existing architecture in any account or any region. Um, and before ending this session, I just want to reflect on and share uh, the type of customers that we see using infrastructure as code and cloud formation on AWS. Uh, so we broadly see three different types of customers. Uh, there are obviously a lot of development teams and DevOps teams who are very comfortable writing code. Uh, so they will, you know, they, they write JSON templates, they treat them as just like any other software. Uh, we saw a lot of that in the previous slides. But it's also important, important to note that even in traditional organizations where they have IT admins or, um, you know, managed service providers, uh, they value templatizing configuration simply because it allows them uh, a mechanism to enforce standard practices. So let's say you are a company of 5,000 people and you want to have a standard set of security group rules that you want everyone to use, you can write a template which is very visible. You know exactly what rules are being followed, and then you can have uh, people in your company use that template to set up their security groups, uh, no matter what application they are running. Uh, so we see that uh, standardization a lot. Uh, it also offers role specialization. So we have customers where you have networking experts, you have database admins, and so on and so forth, so you can uh, have them write CloudFormation templates for their own area of expertise, and then the consumers of that, those templates can actually combine those templates uh, and use them in, uh, in, a, in a tree of templates fashion. And then obviously there are ISVs. So if you are an independent software vendor, there are broadly two types. Um, you know, if you're running a SaaS service, chances are as the customers onboard to your service, you want to scale out. Uh, so you want to potentially you want to create um, a, a replica of the, your entire application stack for each of your customers. Uh, in that case, you can use the same template 
to scale out, uh, to create more stacks and scale out as you bring in customers onto your SaaS platform. Uh, and even if you are a traditional ISV where you need to install application in your customer's AWS account, uh, we see uh, sharing CloudFormation templates uh, either on AWS Marketplace or via any other mechanism serves as a good packaging and deployment mechanism uh, to, to transfer that, those bits between you and your customer. Uh, so that's all I had for this session. Um, we have, I think we, have, we should have plenty of time for questions and answers. And uh, I'll be happy to take your questions. And I also have my colleague, Chris Whitaker. Kind of. uh, so you can ask questions to any of us, and that way we can get uh, more questions and answers done. Thank you.